Please give a warm welcome to Professor David Graeber. Well, is this working? Yeah. Um, Giovanni asked me to talk about the ongoing importance of, of Moses Gift. So I thought I'd say a few words about that, um, both in the positive and, and the negative sense. Um, I mean, say we're not here to critique most, but we should do a little. Um, I mean, it, most this book is, has been so influential in so many different ways. It, it can't help but have had you know, profoundly positive and, and profoundly confusing effects. Um, it's it's or a, a book which launched uh, a thousand intellectual projects. Um, so I think that you know probably the weakest thing about the book is the title. The gift. Um, the fact that that it you know has framed the gift as the great problem of anthropology has been a little confusing because the gift is essentially a negative catch-all category for anything that isn't a commodity relation. Um, so the assumption that all forms of transaction that are not commodity transactions based on economic self-interested calculation are somehow the same. Um, why do we assume that? There's no particular reason why that should be the case, and, and I don't think it actually is. Um, so, in, and, and second of all, one thing that's been rather confusing about the book, I think, has been, don't worry, I'm going to get to the good stuff soon. Uh, <laughs> but one thing that, that, that's, I think, been a little confusing about the book is, is that it also encourages us when we do think about the gift as if it were simply one thing unifying all of these different forms of, of non-commodity transaction um, is that it's sort of modeled on, on the heroic gift that you know, the sort of most magnificent aristocratic forms of gift giving are the paradigmatic form. Um, it's very interesting at some point at the end of, of, of the book he actually comes up with a almost Gramscian theory of how the sort of most characteristic mode of transaction of the dominant class of a particular era becomes their definition of humanity itself. Uh, it's not much observed, but he points out that it takes a long time before the idea of, of economic calculation in the current, um, as we now conceive to be universal in economics, existed for a long period of time, but it just never occurred to anybody that this is a defining feature of humanity. Uh, it was a something certain people did in certain contexts, and it's only quite recently that it became so that in the sort of domi dominant or most characteristic mode of the most of, of the dominant class sort of becomes projected as our model of humanity. Um, in earlier stages, um, you know, let's say the aristocratic gift, which is again not what aristocrats did all the time, but what they thought of as their most characteristic mode of transaction becomes the model for humanity. And in a way, people have read this, uh, taken this book rather rather confusedly to, to make it so. Um, Partly because the, the aristocratic gift has, has so much drama intensity um, and, and human mystery packed into it. Um, whenever I teach the gift, I always give the example of um, most this very, very short um, little piece. It was a commentary on the Greek author Posidonius uh, in somewhere in Anne Sociologique. Uh, um, it was like a three page commentary, but I think it packs a lot into it. Um, Posidonius was observing Celtic nobles and the sort of festivals they had, and they would engage in all these contests, poetry contests and duels, and they would get engaged in gift-giving contests. Uh, and, and every now and then, when in the midst of these contests, one, of the, one player was basically checkmated and received a gift so huge he couldn't possibly return it, um, the only appropriate thing for him to do would be to commit suicide and then distribute the, the, the pieces of, of, of the overwhelming gift to his followers, and this is the sort of ultimate uh, <laughs> reply to someone who, who, who checkmated you, it's the only honorable thing to do. We were thinking about this and, and comparing it to a piece I read in um, a Viking, about Vikings in one of the Icelandic sagas that um, were two Vikings, a story, Einar and Egil, if I remember. Um, one was sort of semi-retired Viking, and the other one was still doing raids. And they're both—they were also poets, um, and um, they liked to sit around writing poetry together. Um, one day, I think Einar was the name of the younger one, came to visit Egil. Egil was out, so he left him a gift: this beautiful shield, this magnificent object that you know, no one had ever seen anything like it. It was covered with mysterious writing and jewels, and um, left it hanging from the rafters. Went off about four hours later. 
Um, Gay Gil comes home and says, my God, what's that? And uh, the thralls all say, well, you know, it's your friend. Um, Einar came over and gave it to you, said it was a present. So he looks at it and said, oh, so I suppose he now expects me to write some sort of a poem celebrating his generosity. To hell of it, I'll kill him. Um, <laughs> so he gets on his horse and rides after him. He can't catch up and the sun goes down. He says, damn, okay, fine, I'll write a praise poem. <laughs> um, so you know, it sort of brings home everything that can be at stake in a gift. I mean, there's a lot going on here. But you know, as a result, these, these things draw you in and, and they do seem to show something intense about human nature. But um, as a result of this, um, I think we get lost as to, you know, there are many, many different sorts of things going on that get collapsed together. I myself tried to disentangle them and the above mentioned book uh, on debt, um, that you, know, you have this sort of communistic relations where you just give to people because you assume that they would do the same, which is the basis of all sociability is just sort of the, the, um, the sort of communistic gift. I call it baseline communism. Um, and this is actually an idea that comes from most, most himself, not in the gift, but in other, um, in his ethnographic lectures. And she said that, you know, the mistake is to assume that communism and individualism are opposed principles. Actually, uh, communism can be the basis of individualism. Um, you can have individualistic communism, a relationship with two people who are just communist with each other, but not with anybody else. Um, and then these kind of like networks of individualistic communism actually are the sort of bedrock of society. Um, and you know, an exchange, the gift, gift exchange, of the, which can turn into this heroic competitive form is a very particular form, which is actually in many ways much more analogous to commercial exchange than either of the other things that get classified as gifts. And then you have hierarchical gifts, um, which defy the logic of reciprocity entirely. In fact, they're the opposite. They're based on the logic of precedent. If you give a gift to it, someone who's clearly an underling or a superior, rather than they're feeling obliged to reciprocate, they'll, they'll expect you to do it again. Um, the a gift becomes a precedent. Um, so you know, a lot of this becomes obscured because of the emphasis on the heroic gift. So OK, that I think is uh, the title thus, uh, therefore, is the weakest part of the book uh, uh, and its ongoing legacy. On the other hand, um, it's also true that the book was written in a hurry for a very particular reason. It wasn't a book, it was an essay. And, and Mose himself said, you know, I, I put off writing this just like he put off writing all those books that he actually wanted to write uh, because we're just not quite ready yet. We don't have enough data um, to really resolve these questions, uh, which he, according to him, was a, a ongoing investigation into the origins of the notion of contractual obligation. That's what the book was actually supposed to, uh, the ongoing research project was actually about. But the reason why he published it was actually political. Um, in effect, the book was his response to Lenin's new economic policy. Most people don't know this. Um, he was, you know, uh, very ambivalent about the Russian Revolution. He was himself a revolutionary cooperativist. He, he um, helped or he ran a cooperative bakery in, in Paris um, and used to go off on, he never did any ethnographic field work, but he did a lot of cooperative field work. He would go off and sort of study the cooperative system in different countries, try to link up producer and consumer co-ops. And, um, and um, you know, he, so during the Russian Revolution, he was like he wrote that you know on the one hand, you know these are my ideas as a socialist being put into practice. On the other hand, I can't stand these guys and the way they're going about it. The fact that they were like killing off the cooperativists didn't help. You know, help. Um, and um, he. And then what really got him was that they couldn't just simply abolish the market. You know, if Lenin first tried to simply institutionalize a non-market society, it didn't really work, and he went back with a new economic policy, reintroduced the market, and most sort of sat down and said, well, we need to rethink these things. What is it about the market we really have a problem with? What is it, what can we get rid of, what can't we? I mean, if Russia, which is the least commoditized, least marketized society in Europe, can't just get rid of it, something else deeper is going on. Um, and thus he initiated a series of sort of intellectual uh, project, political projects in this um, essay, which are, in a weird way, are only now beginning to bear fruit. Um, I think Mary Douglas wrote a really obnoxious introduction to the um, last translation I felt. It was, um, you know, it went on and on about there's no free gift, which is, isn't true, of course there are. Um, but um, she did make the very uh, cogent point, I thought, that um, it, the book kind of, never realizes political potential because it came out at the wrong moment. And she hypothesized that you know, the moment might actually now be coming uh, about that the, the, 
the arguments that he's making here are really relevant and, and actually can reach a larger audience. Um, and, and I think the greatest sign of this was actually a, um, a report put out by the Bank of England a few uh, years ago, a couple, two years now, uh, that people didn't much notice in anthropology, but I think was quite significant. Um, because one of his big themes here is getting rid of the assumption, well, two assumptions. Um, one as, is that, you know, you start with barter, that economic utilitarian transactions are somehow primordial. Um, and while it is true, as, as it's a very much a mistake to read this, uh, his argument that there's like gift economies, there's commodity economies, these are totally different things. Um, on the other hand, um, he's definitely arguing that the economic, uh, you know, the sort of economic textbook version, he goes right after it quite early on. Um, talking about Captain Cook, as a matter of fact, and, you know, how people misinterpreted gifts as, as attempts at barter. Um, so that, that sort of basic economic fairy tale we're all taught is wrong. And this is one of the key um, points he tries to make in the book. And then he uses that to attack social contract theory and says that, you know, the assumption that economic rationality and therefore property are primary and therefore social society itself is our means of, of, of protecting that. Whereas, you know, he's ultimately giving the most subversive blow possible to that idea by saying, actually, no, the primordial contractual relation is the agreement to completely ignore all property relations and, and nullify them. Um, but I think it's really significant that um, that argument about the myth of barter, this is, which is really the foundational idea of, of our entire social order in a certain way. It's the prime, it is like the key myth that everybody, everybody knows, everybody's been taught, no one quite knows where they got it from. But it's just a, a sort of basic common sense which under, uh, which lays the foundations for the, the very principle of economics as the sort of master discipline. Um, has kind of been blown away. This is, um, and, and it's happened, I mean I had played a part in it but I'm just channeling people like Mosin, anthropologists who've been saying this for years, and I just sort of culled the best arguments that has come out of this Mosian tradition. Other people have done a lot of work as well. And um, I, I thought, you know, there's a milestone uh, that was hit a couple years ago when the Bank of England came out a report with its sort of authoritative statement on the creation of money. It was actually very important because among other things they announced that, um, you know, monetarism and the entire philosophical basis of Austerity is completely wrong. Uh, heterodox economics is right. Um, it, was, it was really a bombshell. Um, but, but it also contained, you know, a little thing about the origin of money where they had these Bank of England guys saying, well, imagine you have these two primitive people and one has berries and the other has fish. And it just sounds like they're about to start the myth of barter, but they don't do it. And they say, well, they'd set up an elaborate credit system of debts and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they went the other way, you know. And I remember thinking like, oh, if only I could tell most, we should summon his spirit. We won. We finally did it. <laughs> um, so. This is sure, surely a sign that something is changing. I think that what Jane's comments that, you know, we're moving into a period where the very basic economic questions that we're asking are different, um, that most is relevant. And I think that's really true. I think that, you know, once again, they're saying what happens when they robotize away the jobs? What are we going to do? Basic income, are we going to have to, like, actually base our entire economy on, on simply giving people money? Um, at, at this moment, I mean, the sort of intellectual project, which had been foundering for almost 80 years, is finally bearing fruit. And, and, and most is, sudden, I think, more relevant than he's ever been before. I'll end on that. Thank you.